primero quiero agradecer a First todos. of all, I would like to thank everybody for being on time. Thank you for allowing us to reach you towards through this event, strengthening capabilities in Codex with CCLAC. I thank you for the FAO for the webinar series of webinars where we can gather and strengthen our knowledges about Codex, elementary Codex, uh, with uh, the objective of having a more feedback about our knowledges. I would give you a few guidelines, general guidelines. First of all, this link for the first three presentations for uh, the first uh, module of the um, event and the second module, which will be uh, in December, is in the next few days, we'll have this information through your the emails and our official networks. And please, I would ask you to save this link and the code to access the meeting. Don't forget that we have simultaneous translation in both languages, Spanish and English. That's why I would ask you to please choose uh, the channel of your preference. In the next, the, the sessions will be recorded. So we can um, gather any information afterwards. These are the initial guidelines. At the end of the first presentation, we have a Q&A session. That's why I would like to ask if you could please raise your virtual hand if you have any questions after the presentation. These are the guidelines. And I'm leaving the floor for ingen the engineer Roman Betancourt, who is the president of uh, CCLSC, to start with the event. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dani, and good morning to everybody. Uh, I salute you from Quito and uh, would like to say hello to FAO, uh, regional FAO. Thank you, Marisa, Angeles, and everybody that works at the FAO. Thank you very much. And also, I would like to thank the Ministry of Safety, of Food Safety, and uh, of Korea to be a being for being a part, a very important part of these uh, webinars. And I would like to thank also to all of the people that are presenting in the modules that we're going to have from now on. These are nine uh, webinars like Daniela was explaining to you. And in this special occasion specifically, I would like to salute Amanda Lasso from Costa Rica and Leonardo Vega from Uruguay. We're going to be the people presenting today. I would like to start and we will, we will then start these webinars with them and their presentations. And I would like to remind you all how complex the uh, system is turning uh, and we have a lot of challenges in the future. We have to see that the uh, chain, food chain, for example, for like COVID-19, and we have a lot of challenges, the invasion of Russia and Ukraine, and all of the challenges that we have been facing from many years ago because of climate change, for example, the growth of consumers, also the demand of uh, their sources, and how the industry has developed, and science, of, of course, with new ways of producing food. And we have also plagues and diseases that are resilient and have a, a, a risen themselves. And we, we are looking for technological tools to be able to control them and mitigate them and eliminate them. And we haven't always had the speed of science and the industry of innovation industry have been able to um, tackle these um, these challenges that we have, like, for example, the my, micro antimicrobian resistance or the use or misuse or abuse of antimicrobians also the in the um, production of food and um, also in the human health. All of these challenges makes us see ourselves as consumers and the producers of food in the food industry 
so for us to harmonize ourselves to be in the same guidelines so and the same norms so we can move forward in the commerce and have a basis to be able to protect the health of the consumers and somehow cover all of these demands and all of these challenges that we face and we see in some cases that the consumers have some complex demands and with all due respect uh, all of us are sometimes these demands are extremes and have to be analyzed and we have challenges that are huge challenges for example the respect respect to science and to be able to respect the codex guidelines to be able to comply these uh, with these worldwide norms but we also have a lot of pressure for the other actors that in some that where these uh, actors influence in the decisions of codex all of these challenges has made that together us with together with FAO uh, that works with codex and the ministry of uh, safety food safety and um, medical safety as well uh, gives us the support to be able to tackle these knowledges that we have to express their doubts and to be able to share also their experiences through these series of webinars that we are going to start doing now virtually. That is why I, from Ecuador, as a regional coordination, we are very happy to be able to be heard. We know that uh, throughout time, we will be able to be here with you until the end of the webinars, but also with new participants from all over the Americas, including also the Caribbean. Thank you very much. I'm not going to speak any longer and I will wish you success. And now we have two very special people that are going to speak in this webinar today. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Romel, for your welcoming words. Uh, the floor is to Marisa Caipo, that is an official of in, uh, safety and quality of foods in, uh, for FAO. Marisa, thank you very much, Dani. Welcome to the first webinar, strengthening the, ca the capabilities of, um, of, of Codex in CCLSE in the implementation of norms for Codex to be able to strengthen the resistance of antimicrobials that are transmitted through the fruits. The uh, FAO Office for Latin America and the Caribbean, together with the Agency of Regulation and Control of, of Phytosanitary, also we start this webinar, the series of webinars with subjects related to Codex, Elementary Codex, and food safety. One of the subjects that we're going to speak of is the one of the day. The, the way the Commission of Codex Elementary Commission works, uh, the uh, fundamental context, the future uh, challenges, resistance to micro antimicrobials, health, analysis of risk, con uh, food contamination, amongst others. I hope this session is of your interest, and I would like to wish you a great day and that you keep on following us, uh, following us in this uh, series of webinars. The floor is yours once again, Dani. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marisa, for your words for, for, to open this webinar. So it's time for us to start. I will uh, leave the floor with Leonardo Vega, who is here from Uruguay. He is the Director of Commercial Defense of Ministry of Industry, Energy and Mining. He acts on behalf of Uruguay as a geographical representative of Latin America and Caribbean of Codex. He's a professor of innovation management, strategic management of the context and international economic, economic policy business school, EM. Welcome, Leonardo. Thank you for being here with us today. And the floor is yours. So we can begin with this webinar. Thank you, everybody. It is a pleasure to be here. I thank you all for the invitation. And I hope that the things I'm going to speak of today can be of use for everybody that is here. Just one second, please, because I'm going, I'm going to open my presentation.
pueden ver, ¿verdad? Muy bien. Eh, Very well. Primero, first of all, I would like to tell you a little bit briefly about the history of Codex. So what came before the existence of Codex, because I think this helps us to understand the identity and the way the Codex works and its purpose, of course. Europe has had a very big influence in the norms of Codex. In the 19th century, they had a compilation of norms that didn't have any legal value, but it was a compilation of the norms that are, were, was called Codex Alimentarius in Latin to be able to give a name for the Alimentary Codex. It was called Codex Alimentarius Austriacus. Therefore, it was from Austria. In uh, 1943, we, some recommendations starts to pop up, uh, suggesting to create a organism to be able to create norms for the food industry, because we started to identify that in these norms, there were two sides that have been there throughout time. They, it has always been important because of two different reasons, because of the protection of the health of the consumers, but on the other hand, because the food norms or elementary norms can be a huge obstacle that it can be an obstacle for the international commerce. So these two big worries have been always present in the worldwide agenda for uh, food safety. And then in 1945, FAO was created. In 1948, we created the um, OMS organization. And one of its committees is specifically uh, guided to do the norms in food safety. And in 1955, in a conference together with FAO and OMS, we created a committee of people that knew about this subject, and then it was recommended to be able to see the safety and it, the impact of safety in the food industry. And that's why in 1956, we created that HECFA. It's a commission that has been working together with Codex until today. It, it is not part of Codex, but the work that they do, it's a point where they start to do the scientific analysis to be able to create the norms for Codex. And the HECFA was linked to the food health safety, safety and uh, they started to widen their scope of their capabilities. And they also see contaminants, for example, toxins and residues of veterinary and um, medicine, for example, or antibiotics, and other initiatives that's, that are regional, not worldwide, but afterwards they become a reference, start to add up. In uh, the European reference is always there. First it was with Austria. And then in 1958, we start to think of transforming uh, this initiative in uh, with gathering all of Europe. The, having always as a reference what was what was created in Austria back then. In 1960, in the conferences of FAO in Europe, they talk about the issues that has been generating about the proliferation of the programs, of the norms for food industry, and the impact that this is having in, the, in commerce, for example. In 1961, it is a very important year because the general director of FAO asked to create, wants to create a program, international program of elementary norms or food norms. And then in Europe, especially through the program that was being guided by Codex Elementarius, which was the European Codex Elementarius, they tell us that the general director of FAO, that they 
gather, they would accept this program. And this is a very important factor that in November, FAO decides to create the uh, norms of Codex Elementarius. 1962 actually begins the FAO WHO uh, coordination. So the Codex Alimentarius uh, Commission will be managing the preparation of these standards under the framework of a joint program between FAO and, w, and then WHO. In 1963, the first meeting of the Commission in Rome takes place. That's an interesting uh, participation, an interesting number of uh, people attending. So this whole process has a uh, has a substantial break even point uh, so to speak uh, with the euro wide round of the gap the whole way these uh, trade uh, or commerce or regulations were managed so world trade organization established and a set of agreements are reached and those agreements significantly changed the way they were managed. At the gap times, uh, countries uh, would decide uh, what agreements to adhere and which no. But after the World Trade Organization, uh, this is an adhesion system. So you have to adhere to everything. If you join the WHO, that means that you are joining joining all programs that that are being implemented. And one of those agreements is the health and and and, and uh, fido sanitary agreements. This is the MSF, and this will be part of the Codex Alimentarius standards. Those that places the Codex in the top of the list in terms of relevance because it's not just uh, because the protection of uh, health of the population, but also it's uh, relevant in terms of uh, commerce or trade when deciding if a given standard has a scientific uh, background. Entonces, en síntesis, ¿qué es el codex? So summary, what's, el codex, uh, what's the codex? Uh, it's an uh, intergovernment agency for the preparation of uh, international food standards or norms. That's our reference uh, standards under the framework of uh, FA, FAO, WHO joint program. Main goals, as I said, are basically two. Health protection of consumers, that is the preparation of standards on food safety and uh, food quality, and guaranteeing that uh, uh, standards have a scientific background to protect the uh, population's health rather than a disguised way of uh, trade barriers. On the other option is uh, deceiving practices uh, so as to make a uh, food item more attractive compared to other by saying that uh, Entonces, eh, so, el Codex, lo que se elabora son Codex is just the food standards that uh, countries use as a reference. One cannot say that uh, I will, uh, uh, I did this, uh, I, I will, I will not uh, be joining this because I don't, I don't want uh, food standards. I will just say that uh, we follow the Codex standards, and that, that's it. Well, that's not so. These are not thought uh, to be to substitute a, a national legislation. These are just a reference. Each country will have to go through the 
adaptation and putting these standards as passed by a codex, uh, adapt them to the national legislations. Bien, pasemos entonces ahora a ver... Let's uh, discuss now the, the um, structure of Codex and how this is uh, implemented. Codex has this structure, and we will elaborate on it later, but we have the committee. That's all the commission. That's uh, where all the members are, are represented. Uh, commission members are those the FAO country members or WHO country members that uh, are willing to join these codex. Then we have two more agencies or levels, the executive committee, which is a subgroup as part of the commission doing the political management of the agency and then a secretariat uh, with a mandate of the administrative uh, portion. Then there are several technical committees in the, the preparation of the standards. We have a general affairs committee, then a committee for products, special intergovernment agencies, and uh, regional coordinating committees. So in each one of these boxes, we have a, a number of technical committees. So, so uh, this is the uh, structure of uh, Codex. The commission to date has 189 members. But in case of 188, these are states, uh, state members. And then we have a special category, which is uh, a member organization, which is European Union. As I said, in order to join the uh, uh, Codex Commission, you have to be a member of FAO or WHO and request the directors uh, of such organizations to uh, join this uh, commission. Other countries, and although they are part of uh, FAO or WHO, they might not be willing to join the commission, and they may be part of observers. They meet once every year. Well, in, in, during the pandemic, uh, meetings were virtual. But when uh, meetings are on site, uh, once in Rome, in the FAO, uh, and, or Geneva, the WHO uh, siege. What's the commission? The commission is the, is the, the, the decision-making agency or, or group, those making the final decision. So most importantly, they adopt the standards which go through a preparation process, which will end up in a decision made by the commission adopting the uh, standard or not. Then there is a review of, of, the, of the different programs and schedules so, because we cannot, uh, because, uh, they, they have the mandate to review what has been prepared at the level of the executive committee supported by the secretariat, and of course, reviewing the budget. The executive committee, as I said, that's the political branch, has a uh, chair, three vice uh, chairs, all these positions uh, are by are elected and the chair and the three vice uh, chairs plus six regional coordinators as we will see codex has um, as a regional organization where each region 
as a regional coordinator to coordinate activities of the different member states in the region on uh, their work on codex. And then the geographic representatives, no, eh, they, que velar por los intereses del codex. O sea, they, nor, they, they are they will not be submitting the interest of the region. They are, sell, they are elected by the region, but I'm the, I'm the geographic representative for Latin America and the Caribbean, but I am not going to the Codex Commission to, uh, to what the regional countries think. I go, I attend the executive uh, committee to defend that to protect the codex interests as a whole geographic because i because i represent a specific region which is not the case of the regional coordinators so their, their, their mandate is to submit the opinion of the regional countries the geographic representatives are elected to the commission for two periods and maybe elected only re-elected only once which is the the session of the commission the geographic areas are africa asia latin america and the caribbean uh north america the uh, east uh, near east uh, europe and uh southwestern pacific there's no overlap between geographic representatives and coordinators. The executive committee is the one preparing the, uh, the agendas. And sometimes they make decisions, uh, but these decisions are to be taken to the commission. The executive committee will the commission meets once a year the executive committee meets uh, more much more regularly and the executive uh, committee will put together subgroups as part of the committee to address specific topics many of those subgroups are led by some of the vps or the vice uh, vice chairs or we and the secretariat of the commission and have to uh, lead uh, the administrative uh, support, uh, coordination of work, uh, and the uh, point of contact, that's a gathering point of the points of contact of so, uh, Codex. Countries have different contacts, so the secretary will talk to the con point of contact, and the point of contact will disseminate the information throughout the countries. As I said, there are six regional committees led by a coordinator. Those regional committees also work on the regional standard to codex as a global standard, but also there are cases where for certain food items which are uh, used uh, and, 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 and traded in, in a region, but they, they are not uh, known worldwide. So Codex says that there is no reason for those regions not to prepare standards and since there is a relevant trade of those uh, food items. Okay, not worldwide, therefore, those who are rules or standards are approved as regional standards. And then regional standards, as those items uh, are disseminated throughout the world, may be revised as global or worldwide standards. These are the regional committees today. And who are the, which is the country that has a, a core, the, the coordination today in the case of Latin America and the Caribbean is, it is the Ecuador. And as 
with Rommel. Luego tenemos eh, los comités técnicos. We we'll then have the technical committees, which are um, general topics, committees for uh, basic products, and also group, group, uh, work groups that are uh, amongst the governments. So these are the three committees that we have. First of all, let's talk about general topics. Up to date, we have five that are being worked on, general principles and uh, plague, plague sites residues, for example, and contaminants and food addictive addition and uh, the special standard for food and nutrition and the contaminants that are present in food. And each one has their own committee. We will have then also the residues for veterinarios. Uh, Plagicides, and we also have pesticides, and we also have analysis and take uh, taking um, samples. And we also have committees on basic products. Here we have, for example, with your oils and uh, fruits and uh, herbs, fresh herbs, for example, culinary herbs like in India. Some are active now, and other are have their activities which are are not working which are on standby without having having a date where they should start working on their work or working again and they have standards that they have to coordinate that it to keep working and also we have some of them that are on standby and the list is quite long you can see some of some of the basic products that are on standby and we have also the work groups that are amongst governments. Here we have these three groups that are for foods that are obtained through biotechnological means, which are, is uh, the group of Japan, also uh, food for animals, uh, by dyn and also the antimicrobial resistance. Here we have the national committees for codex. They do the work at the level of codex and then we have the national committee for codex that exists in most of the countries that are members these committees they work in every country has a committee and this is the contact point for codex worldwide with the government organisms in the national level so one of the their jobs is to first of, no. to update the government, which are the standards that are being worked on for Codex, to coordinate the action of different national organisms that are going to be directly or indirectly affected by the standard linked to the food safety, and also to interact because Codex is always asking the countries for their opinions regarding the standards that are being worked on or the subjects that are being considered or topics that are being considered. So this is a reference that will be able to answer these questions for Codex and we have to gather the opinion of each organisms that are members of uh, the committee. And also the national committee is the one that tells uh, which are the standards that are going to be uh, approved at a Codex level. This is the history of Codex. We have seen the structure of Codex. Now we're going to see briefly what is the process to be able to approve a standard through Codex. It's a process with different steps. We have a first step that is the long step, and then afterwards we have the fast way. The uniform way or the usual way, it has eight steps to go through to be able to approve a norm. And there's also in this procedure, two rounds of questions that have to be answered. And then on the fast way, we have only five steps and one round of comments comments that we can write and review. 
How does this creating a norm, a standard start? Somebody proposes a standard, presents a document, a project, and then a document, and uh, to elaborate this norm regarding a certain topic, specific topic, and then this starts to be considered by the Commission of, of Food, of Codex Alimentarius. If they want, then they can approve a new work group that always have in mind the project that was presented and the critical examination done by the executive committee on this standard. And then they approve for this work group to start working on this standard, on this norm. And then the, this, they give this norm to a specific work group, this organ that took this task as their own, starts with a project of a standard, a previous a pilot of the project. And then we start, then we went from step one to step two. Then we have a previous, a pilot of the standard of the norm. So in this step, the Secretary of Codex is the one, the organisms that works in this norm, in this step. And then after the Secretary of Codex uh, gives it to all of the countries to be able to get a feedback on it, like I commented before, through the focal point, through the committees of the uh, International Transaction of Alimentarius Codex, and we start to gather feedback from the different members about the standard that was proposed. These uh, feedback, this feedback is then passed through the secretary and then is sent to the organ that is working on the standard, that is in charge of the standard. And then we start to modify the original document or not. We start to see uh, what needs to be changed, having in mind these feedbacks. And then if these observations, we can, are, are in very important, we can take a more uh, important decision on the changing, changing the standard. And then we will see at the end of this presentation, I call the section of the principles, we will see afterwards in the end of the presentation what this means. After the, the organ modifies these documents, we have then the project of the standard. Here we send it to the members, we send it to the executive committee so they can examine it and to the commission to see if they consider that, that we can adopt it as a project, as a standard. After a norm has approved this step, once again, we send it to all of the members so we can gather feedbacks and observations. This is a similar step like we did in step three. In uh, step seven, we examine and make a decision on the standard, on the norm. And on step eight, we have a pilot of the norm that is given to the members so we can evaluate it and give it back to the executive committee so they can thoroughly examine it and then to the commission to adopt the norm. And then this uh, standard or this norm is approved. This is the uniform procedure. And then we have the uh, accelerated or speeded procedure. And then instead of having eight steps, it has five steps. Basically, the difference is that we focus, we just don't do this step number six and seven, and we, we do step five and step eight. Therefore, we eliminate two when we have five steps. In Codex, 
with with the creation of elementary or food norms it is linked to risks in the food industry so therefore in codex we distinguish two different steps which are completely different the first one is the analysis of the risks and this step what we do is gather the information that allows us to determine what are going to be the conditions in which a food item it is not considered a risk to the health of the consumers and the second step is once we have the scientific information in hand we need to see which is the most uh, adequate way to create a standard on it the first step is the analysis of risks and for this step for the analysis of risks which is specifically scientific the codex elementarius has the support of a lot of uh, specialized committees the most relevant one is the SECFA, and there are also other committees that support with scientific evidence to be able to create these norms. We also have committees of uh, experts in uh, pesticides or plaguicides and uh, also microbiology, biological risks. And also we have a, a group of experts to be able to answer questions that we might have specific questions after this scientific step and the evaluation of the norm. We have then the step of risk analysis. And then the other part, which is the to create the standard, the norm is called the administration of the risks. This so far, these are the numbers of the results that we have of the work we have done in Codex. Uh, Codex has created norms, uh, practic uh, practical codes, uh, guidelines and uh, standards, general standard for uh, food additives and um, maximum uh, limit for pesticides or residues and also for veterinary um, medication or drugs, uh, residue of veterinary drugs which uh, limit. This is also handled differently in every country. Some countries adopt this automatically. For example, everything that is regarding to the maximum um, limit of pesticides, for example, or veterinary and residue, this is adopted because usually the countries have their own lists regarding this. So we, they just add the new uh, pesticides or, or, or veterinary and residues. These are the new levels and they adopt it. There are some other cases, for example, which could be the guidelines or practical or the, or the codes for the practices, it, it is a little bit harder for them to adopt it because it, it demands some adaptations because sometimes their norms, uh, the food um, norms uh, in each country are already there. So therefore, this is more of a reference. So they need to adapt it to their own standards. Uh, some cases in the national legislation, it is easy to adopt. And sometimes the standards that are in codex, they can be added in a country linked to the national legislation. And sometimes they need to regulate it a little bit. It depends on the nature of the norm and the structure of the um, legislation of the food safety standards of the country that is receiving this norm. To end my presentation, I would like to talk about a very important subject or topic that is, I'm going to be honest, it's, going, it's being the center of the debates regarding, on every debate regarding Codex. These topics are linked to the essence of Codex. And the principles that are in Codex. You can see that the reference that I did for the, in the history of Codex, Codex started with 
these doubts that was the protection of the health of the consumers of the population and also another part which is to um, also create a co external international commerce practices so to be able to solve both parts we needed the scientific information if i'm talking about a specific food item and i say okay i need to create a standard or a norm that protects the health of the population i said okay in this specific food item the maximum doses of additives that it can have is this number and this those doses where does it come from how do we how do we specify it from scientific analysis there's some scientific analysis that can establish to the consumers for example the which is the maximum account uh, amount of uh, substances that they can consume as a human being and therefore through science we see what are the requirements and this it's com composition and the its production etc etc that are very relevant when we start to create a standard and so that's the scientific information in order to protect the population's health and then we have to decide what's the protection level we want to offer those individuals so codex sets according to an agreement a certain a reasonable protection level that is what's the reasonable protection one may say that countries may want to adopt a protection level which might be higher well that is possible the problem is that when a country wants to adopt a higher protection level then they have to provide scientific information not to codex but at international trade, a foreign trade, they have to prove that such greater protection has a scientific background. Thus, the problem. Codex has become a reference of what's reasonable and what's not reasonable to protect popular people's uh, healthcare. Codex says that for, for uh, the reasonable level is five for a given food item. If a country has 10 or 15 instead of uh, five, then it is possible that that 15, the only purpose is just a barrier for trade of such uh, food items. So, and then I'll you, the, 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 the WU World Trade Organization says you can set the, the level, the, the protection level you want, but you need, uh, uh, you need uh, scientific background. If it's above the codex then you will have to explain why you're doing so what's the scientific background or scientific support as i said on the one hand that as uh the codec has uh, become in a reference uh, a key reference uh, for uh food uh, uh, trade packaged food trade but it is also a problem because it it creates pressures in the preparation of uh, standards and these are not only prepared uh, as to what is the protection level but also we have to think of uh, what will be the commercial impact of it and we have to deal with that but then the key here is that how codex will address this well codex has an additional problem it's not really a problem it's part of its nature codex adopts decisions by consensus but it's difficult you may say that it's too difficult to reach a consensus but the point is that it is difficult that when, when the decision to be made is based on preferences, but it's much easier that the decision to be made is based on scientific information. And since Codex is based on scientific information, then it's relatively easier to implement a mechanism where the, the uh, a mechanism for consensus-based decisions. But in a series of provisions, uh, Codex says that when you are about to make a decision, the scientific support is the key. 
so that if someone disagrees, it has to use the scientific base. So the scientific information, scientific evidence shall be supported. Codex will not accept that the scientific evidence uh, is based on a preference. So the consensus concept, it's not that everyone thinks alike. Consensus for Codex is decisions are made based on scientific information. And if a country disagrees, they have to be on scientific basis. And disagreements without scientific uh, uh, background are disregarded. Let's say, let's say I, 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 I'm part of a committee uh, preparing a standard, then most countries, uh, okay, say in, in the risk analysis they step, uh, all the necessary information was submitted for the preparation of the standard. The standard was prepared and the country says, well, the chair of the committee says, okay, it seems uh, the, the, the center is ready, so we will now submit this to the executive committee. And then somebody says, but I do not agree. So what happens? And somebody could say, okay, there is a lack of consensus. Well, no, we have to see whether it is a lack of consensus or not. Questions are to be made, are to be asked. First question is, based your your disagreement is based on what the individual could say that he or she disagrees because considers that uh, no consideration was made of the of a given product uh, and therefore the expert to committee preparing the standard should have uh, done an ana a different analysis well that's an observation with a scientific uh, basis. And if the chair of the committee will agree to that, it could say, okay, there's no agreement, there's no consensus, we'll ask the expert committee to carry out such specific analysis. Let's say the chair asks, you disagree based on what? And he says, I don't like the standard. Why? I don't like it. I don't know, I just don't like it. That is not a disagreement. That's not a valid disagreement. You could say, okay, he or she says he's not willing to vote. Okay, fine. It's not just the willingness to vote or not. We need scientific background to disagree. Otherwise, for the chair, there is a consensus. Those disagreeing uh, can uh, and uh, will will be part of the minutes, and we'll explain why. But the, if the disagreement uh, did not have a scientific background, then consensus uh, is present. This is an interpretation of a codex standard, which I will share with you. Not every codex countries uh, ag agrees on that. Some countries uh, claim that a country not necessarily will have to offer a scientific background to disagree. There might be other reasons other than science that may allow countries to block the approval uh, of a standard. But since there is a consensus requirement, country says that despite the disagreements there is no scientific background then this should be considered and therefore the approval should be blocked to date this is being discussed at a codex uh, level this is an extremely difficult challenging issue and it depends on on the development these may change the identity the sole core of the codex the way the way it operates and the uh, uh, rules that have to be met. But let's look at the principles, which are those general guidelines that the Codex Commission has approved over time. So let me um, describe the some which I believe are important. There is a decision by the Commission in 1995 
stating that, like I said before, the approval of standards is based on sound scientific data. And that the main purpose is to establish quality and safety requirements. So we, we, we know the, 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 the foundation, which is scientific and the purpose. Then we have a 2001 decision where it emphasizes that in the risk analysis stage, uh, have to be separated. So when I'm analyzing risks, you cannot cannot uh, make considerations on how do you want to prepare the standard. If you are preparing the standard, the informa scientific information is to be available. So Codex sets a priority that the fact that in the preparation of standards, you cannot exert pressure on the experts provide an input for the preparation of the standards. So group expert groups have to act as independently as possible. This decision, 1995, says that there are other things other than the scientific background that may be taken into account for the preparation of standard. And this decision says that, yes, and they are called other legitimate factors. So it says that there might be other reasons in dealing with the protection of uh, health of uh, consumers and uh, of fair trade practices for the preparation of the standard. Now, what's important here is that these are additional inputs for the preparation of the standard. That is, these are additional additional to the scientific information. It's not a replacement. I mean, I cannot say uh, that the uh, fair trade practices uh, are more important are important to ignore a scientific background and and a scientific scientific background will never go against fair trade uh, practices not all the other legitimate factors are valid uh, to be discussed uh, other things that the uh, uh, agreement requires if you want to add other legitimate factors in the in the discussion of a standard those factors have to be worldwide accepted that is not that in my country so and so therefore i want these to be an input for the preparation of a standard if it comes from a country it's not other country uh, it's not a, a worldwide so it's not a valid input for the discussion and if you want to add other legitimate factors into the discussion of a standard then you have to offer a support in terms of what it is and how these will be affecting the decisions made in the preparation of the standard. Say that I I prepared a standard and in, in a committee. So the, there's a, a country that disagrees. What's the procedure to be followed by the chair? If the disagreement is based on scientific information, number one, if not, then the chair has to tell the member that, well, your disagreement is not valid because it will not, it will not break the consensus. These standards will be approved. So the country, what the country can do is can uh, leave that in the minutes, but the, the the only the only alternative is that. Let me show you now the same thing, but in a flowchart for clarification purposes. First, by a risk scientific analysis, as I said. This is done by experts other than the codex committee. So on the one hand, what's the scientific information supplied for, uh, for analysis and then the evaluation or the assessment process by this expert committee that will prepare the input for the committees to work. 
Once that the committees get the scientific information, if we're going to add other legit legitimate factors to, to create the standard, certain countries can say, apart from the scientific information that we decided on, we, I want to have through the elaboration of the standard to consider also the practices for the external commerce, for example. When somebody puts this forth, the chair has to evaluate three different things regarding this proposal. First of all, if it is a legitimate factor that this country is setting forth, if the uh, topic that they are presenting is linked to the protection of the health of the consumers or um, equitative practices for commerce. If the committee decides that what that country is is proposing is not inside, doesn't agree with the project, they have to reject the proposal of that country. If the chair says, okay, whatever you're proposing, uh, we agree on, but you have to justify it. Can you please justify why this other factor has to be added in the process of the elaboration of the standard? The country can say this is because I want it, that's it. It has to have data behind that justifies why they should consider it. And finally, the chair has to evaluate if this factor that was has already been assessed fits in other legitimate factors and if they have a fundamental base and it is it accepted worldwide. If it's not accepted worldwide, it also, it also has to be rejected. So for another legitimate factor to be able to be added on the consideration of the norm, it has to go through these three steps. First has to be inside the legitimate factor, it has to be, it has a, a basis, a fundament and data and accepted worldwide. When they pass three, three steps, it becomes an input that we can add to the process of the elaboration of the standard. So this standard is going to be processed through with scientific data and other legitimate factors that are, be, are being added as an input to be able to create the standard. The committee then starts to proceed to create the standard. Once it is finished, the chair asks if there's a consensus in the approval of the standard. Yes or no, if there's a consensus, perfect. The standard is created and then goes to the next step. The process has different steps as we have seen, and this can be repeated in the different parts of the process. For example, the chair says, okay, we have finished this work and this is the standard and it is approved as such. And if it's done, there's no consensus. What he has to ask is this, if this consensus is based in scientific data or not. If the person that does disagree says yes, it is based on scientific data and the scientific data seem reasonable, the chair, what he has to do is then to proceed, he proceeds to gather more information to the experts that are intervening in the process of the elaboration of the standard. When the chair asks, what is the basis of your disagreement? The people disagreeing, they explain something without scientific basis. The, the chair then says the only option that you have is to abstain yourself. So therefore, they'd have to record the reasons why they did not follow up the elaboration of the standard and the standard is still is still going to be approved anyway this process is the process of the creation of a standard so up to date there are other countries what happens if there are the countries that disagree there are other countries that disagree when in the options that the chair has in a already created standard what we are debating today some countries, members of Codex, is that some countries say that when the chair asks if there is any disagreement, there are some countries that says, yes, I disagree. And these disagreements, if they have no scientific data and 
despite of that, the standards is on standby. For us, the, the countries in Latin America specifically, we think this is um, very important to be looked at because when we reinterpret the standards of codex, we do not, there is no basis on the legal aspects of codex. So the issue that they're arising here is that some countries have the right then to disagree on standards, not based on scientific data, but just disagreeing because they just don't like a certain standard. And that generates a lot of uncertainty in the um, way codex works. And this is my presentation. I hope it has not been so long for you and I hope I was clear enough. And thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, Leonardo. An excellent presentation. Thank you for explaining with great detail everything regarding Codex. We have a lot of questions and I'm going to start reading them and give you some time to answer them. The first question is, uh, what are the basis for a norm to pass through the uniform steps procedure or the speed up procedure? It is not. I think that it is not, there's not a specific criteria, it depends on the circumstances. For example, in the case of a standard that may be required because of an emergency, then it goes through the uh, speeded up procedure. If not, it goes through the uniform procedure. Thank you very much, Leonardo. The second question is, what is the exact difference between a standard and guidelines. To say it, put it simply, the standard is very similar to what then becomes a law. The standard, it is not um, something that the countries have to comply with, it's not imposed on them, but it is written in a way that not always, but many of many times they can be added in a degree, for, for example, in a decree to be able to have to establish laws, specific laws when somebody has to comply with the law or not. But the guidelines are just guides. It is harder to then establish if somebody's complying with it or not because they're just guides. They're just uh, general criteria that they're, they're, they're asked to maybe follow or not. Thank you, Leonardo. And the third one is how do you agree in the plenary? Is it by vote of the members or do you need to agree, get an, obtain a consensus? That's a very good question. Uh, first is what one thing is what happens and one the other thing is what should happen. What should happen if, if there's a disagreement and this disagreement needs to comply with these points that I commented before, there's a disagreement and they have to say that this is based on a scientific, with scientific data and if it doesn't have scientific data, the disagreement doesn't exist and we need to then ignore the person disagree because they don't have scientific data to follow their uh, disagreement. If the person disagree and has scientific data to then we cannot negotiate because it is science. And then there's something else that is the negotiation. In some cases, we negotiate to be able to establish a standard that everybody can agree on. Sometimes we don't everybody agree. There's a specific 
uh, norm of identity, for example, where the countries of Latin America, we proposed to create a standard and nobody agreed. We didn't, we didn't get a consensus. There were countries that didn't agree, therefore the standard could not move forward and be approved. This is a very specific case because in normal circumstances, the standards uh, created by Codex, they are linked to the safety of food. So therefore, in this case, it was not of safety regarding safety, it was regarding identity. So therefore the rule on the fact that somebody cannot disagree if it's not in base, based on in scientific information doesn't work because the original standard doesn't need a scientific basis. So what do we consider something the standard that dies or not? It is linked to traditions and practices regarding each region or each country more than scientific data. When there are certain standards that don't need that scientific data, I can disagree. So therefore, in my region, for example, I can disagree, for example, if something that in another country they agree on and they don't need specific scientific data on it, and we cannot all agree, we don't approve the standard. And there is no rule with that can solve this issue then. How can a country be an active member of it has to be a member of the FAO or the WHO and has to contact uh, the director of FAO or WHO that they want to be an active member of Codex Alimentarius. Next question, the difference between member and observer, apart from the countries that are not members, who else can be an observer? There are certain governmental organizations and other international organisms that are observers of the commission. Amongst observers, we have different categories. One which are members of FAO and WHO that have not decided yet to be part of Codex. Countries that are not members of FAO or WHO but they would like to be in the commission of uh, Codex Elementarius. They could also can be observers and other or international organisms that want to participate in the meetings of Codex Elementarius. They can also do that and also non-governmental organizations. They can also be observers. Thank you. The next question is, Codex, to evaluate a standard, do they consider the scientific basis and the in commercial impact? And sometimes they don't agree. How do you get to a agreement when this happens? I think I have already explained this in part, but the scientific data has to be the most important part. And when, let's say I'm talking about a food item and we need scientific information and we create a standard based on the scientific information and there's a certain country that says i do not agree with this standard being approved because it would affect us in a commercial point of view they cannot put their commercial interests before the scientific data although they do not agree with this standard from the point of view of codex rules and norms, this disagreement is not considered because it is not based on scientific data. Next question, please. I'm going to add two questions together. In a equitative practices in commerce, um, we, let's say we are creating a standard for a certain food item. 
And when we're creating this standard, there's a component on the elaboration of the standard. This is the identity. There are some countries that say there's other countries where they um, deceive or the, they deceive other consumers when they don't say what it is actually on that food item. For example, I'm creating a standard for mayo. And there's a certain country that says it's very important for us to establish the requirement of the presence of egg of a certain percentage. So certain things that are not mayo don't come out as mayo or labeled as mayo. So that has one doesn't have egg. It's not a requirement of safety. It's quality and identity. So to add this in the standard, it has to establish just a basis for commerce, for example, so the people that elaborate mayo don't have to compete with other people that create another product that makes the consumer believe it is mayo, but it is actually not mayo. Next question. Is there an agreement for uh, once the uh, standards is implemented, does somebody need to comply with this uh, standard? Oh, no, it depends. The standard, it, there's no, there is no sanction. Uh, I, if we are part of Codex Alimentarios, what we do then, we need to put in our laws, in our legislation, we, we have to put it, link it to the standards approved by Codex, but there's, it is not an obligation for us to do this. Eventually, maybe I will have some issues uh, on the commercial side if we don't do this. If I introduced, for example, an, ob an obstacle linked to the commerce, if I have a standard that does not agree with the norm in the codex level, and I did not, the fact of not put in of not of not taking this law of codex it gives the evidence that that the the norm that i agreed on it will obstruct the commerce i don't have obligation of of, of complying with the norm but i may i may have issues in the commerce size on the side of commerce for not complying with the codex norm why some standards are mandatory and others in a facultative manner. There are goats, goals of practice, standards, and uh, guidelines. Well, that's a good question. Actually, I don't have uh, an answer for that. I'll have to uh, review all the standards uh, uh, using these uh, two forms, these two drafting to see whether there is a pattern before giving you uh, a final answer. In principle, as I said, the categories are those that uh, say something as a statement. This is the maximum limit uh, of an additive should not exceed uh, a given number that it will be the first uh, category of drafting then you have the other the other alternative which are guidelines uh, general standards so where it is difficult to say a priori if a case is or not for instance a guideline uh, reading that uh, in the preparation of a food item we should have uh, updated information, uh, information that is traceable relative to each one of the inputs uh, you, you used. When implementing whether that was met or not, it's difficult because uh, the, the, the standard is in general. But then we have contingent uh, standards where its application depends on a contingency. But that that, that, that they, they will specify the type of contingency for application. A contingent standard is when you say, if something happens, then these uh, standards should be applied. Otherwise, it is not applicable. 
but the question on uh, the drafting styles, I believe it's a, it's a lack of uh, standardization in, in, in terms of the drafting itself. Once a decision is made, the process for a revision, that, does that require additional scientific information or has to go through a different procedure? No, it's the same one. You have to revisit the whole process. Let's redo the whole process. If a country uh, has uh, that, uh, what what the codex uh, has said uh, omitted to did to to define the protection of consumers if the codex sets a given level uh, the typical case of uh, of an additive uh, with a maximum limit so let's say you say the maximum level is uh, eight and another country will set a limit of four. Was the codex wrong? Well, not necessarily. It could be uh, two, uh, one of two things may have happened. One, is that such country, the codex, it was wrong? No, standards are prepared based on the standard intake worldwide. But let's say that such an additive is related to a food item that in a given country has an increase and that uh, extremely higher consumption compared to the other the rest of the world. So let's say five kilograms per year in a given country. This is because this is a traditional since this is a traditional food item the, the, they eat at 10 kilograms per per year. So the level based on a worldwide uh, intake is not consistent uh, with the standard uh, intake in such countries. So there is a scientific foundation why the level should be lower. So that's an explanation why levels uh, set by certain countries are lower than the standard. And others do so without a scientific uh, background. So when you ask, tell me why you set a lower and that occurred by the codex the and the answer is because i wanted to but i don't have a scientific foundation for, for that now now if a country were to have a scientific uh, background to set a lower level or more um, even more demanding than codex well then in that case the codex uh, standard would be wrong i i know no case uh, in that type of situation countries with more restrictive levels are in, 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 in one or other categories so with the peculiarities justifying the different uh, limitations. On the same topic, there is another question here. Codex could uh, be technically uh, blocking trade when uh, uh, setting such a restrictive levels? No. The one that could say that is a special group which is put together at the uh, World Trade Organization. A country should to consider or may consider that uh, that uh, that this level is blocking uh, uh, exports, uh, should call for consultations, uh, fail to agree, call for um, a special group and the special group should uh, say that whether the standard uh, is an obstruction for trade or not and that that type of decisions uh, can only be made by a special group of the world trade organization codex will not issue opinions on non national legislations European Union as a, as a member, they have uh, their own uh, levels, but without the scientific background, they have reduced those levels. 
Therefore, they're affecting the production of uh, fruits and vegetables. What are the alternatives for countries to so, so, so that the uh, EU follow those uh, limits uh, set by the codec? We, they, they, they have to go to the World Trade Organization for consultation. The World Trade Organization has a judgment, has a, has a, has a, has a system that starts with the consultation, and this is binding. The topic of the, of the consultation is the only one that I can submit to, I can uh, submit to a trial. So you have to take the cons consultation to the European Union, the World Trade Organization, and then I say, I understand that the levels uh, you set are a technical barrier for trade. And then the, the, the matter is discussed and then the European Union will have to offer the scientific foundations. Without that, then uh, you can kindly request a change in those levels and stop applying such barriers uh, to the affected countries. And if not, then the country uh, can request uh, the, the special group to decide whether the limit set by the European Union has a scientific foundation or is just uh, the, the trade barrier. Probably this question has been already answered, but still is uh, interesting. When changing a standard, is there any recommended time for adoption, considering that certain countries, as you said, with the codex, uh, uh standards are binding for national legislations as i said codex will not sanction countries for failing to adopt the standards each country will adopt the standards at the pace of their preference some countries when a codex uh, a standard is uh, passed I understand my national legislation already includes or considers what the codex is stating. So there is nothing else to be added. Other, other cases at the Mercosur level, for instance, uh, Mercosur standards are approved based on codex, codex standard. And then those standards which are prepared for Mercosur are are added verbatim uh, to uh, national legislations, but the pays uh, that is all, it's all up to the, each country. We know codex is applied to uh, human food. Is there a committee for pet food standards? No, and I don't think it's a good thing either because uh, Codex, I believe, has to keep uh, focused. The uh, focus is human uh, food items, uh, not pets. If we were to consider the diets of the different types of animals, which are completely different to those of humans, that would require a huge amount of resources and to to, to give you an example, in terms of uh, uh, food legislation, uh, uh, an important reference is the normal intake of an individual. What's the structure of normal intake? How much a person will eat in terms of uh, proteins, uh, lipids, what type of proteins, what, and, and from there, we can set the maximum limits, for instance, for additives, uh, pesticides, uh, uh, residues of veterinary products, so on and so forth. But uh, because weight uh, is about, is between 70, 130 kilograms. Now for dogs, I mean, from a, we can go from Chihuahuas to a Great Danes. So I could set the uh, intake uh, by kilogram of dog, but that, that would be a chaos. I mean, uh, that, that's not possible to address. Um, 
Can an observer be chair of a committee? I don't understand the question. A, a, a member of an observer could uh, chair an observer, an observer. Can an observer be elected as a chair of an electronic uh, work group? Leonardo? Leonardo? Uh, uh, it's an observer can a uh, chair, an electronic group, uh, an electronic uh, work group. Why not? Somebody has to has to act as a chair. It has to be a member. So that that's why I don't understand the question. I, I mean, it, it, uh, is that in a special case? There's one last uh, there's a question which I asked to be rephrased. Let me read it for you. Give me a second. In the, in the uh, for additives, are you using, considering a sweetener for fermented milks, but in the a specific codex for fermented milks so updated in 2018, there is no mention of its use for the same additive. Is, is that the question? Is not I, I? I guess you're asking asking if that's an inconsistency. Well, no, I I I am not familiar with the particular. I have no knowledge of those particular standards so as to give you a final answer. It sounds like that there is a, 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 a lack of consistency, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so uh, final in my, my answer. So the, what, what, which one should be taken into account? That's actually the question. But inconsistencies are inconsistency and codex, we don't have a hierarchy. I mean, uh, remember that codex standards are not mandatory, are not legal standards. Uh, uh, an inconsistency in the, in the country standards is, is a far um, or is far worse. If I have a standard in the country saying that something it's a crime, and another standard says it's not a crime, then there is a problem. Because when somebody commits that, is that was that a crime or not? So th those type of uh, inconsistencies in 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 the, in the country's legislation are a problem. But when these are are facultative, uh, non non mandatory inconsistencies are addressed through consultations and see what happened and uh, when they are added to the national legislation, then adopt. Uh, uh, what it uh, what it corresponds. It's not good to have inconsistency, but it's not that severe. Uh, unlike uh, 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 an inconsistency in the in the country legislation, that specific case, my suggestion is asking the commission that prepare the standard uh, so to see what's the, what's their opinion before putting that into the national legislation. Okay, one, when can you get information on the, the allowed uh, contaminants uh, levels which are not in the general uh, standard? Are there any other references or sources? I don't know, really, I, I don't know. I, uh, or the regional coordinator, Rommel, I believe can have a better answer. Okay, duly noted. Thank you, Leonardo. Okay, let me uh, offer the floor to the attendees and maybe anything else to add. So please help me with this last question to see if we can answer it. Thank you, Leonardo, for the suggestion. <laughs> Could you help me with the question, please, Dani? 
I'm going to repeat it once again. Where can we get information about the level of contaminants that are allowed for the products that are not indicated in the general standards for contaminants? Do we have any other references for this? Thank you. I understand that the maximum levels that are allowed when they're not in codex, is the ones that are in codex, we can find them in the web page when we, we go to the search button and then we upload all of the standards of codex. If they're not in codex and other countries are sent them because with those criteria of each country and they can be uploaded, then the work there is a little bit harder because the countries are the owners of their own information through their websites and then there will be available in the website of each country. I don't know. I don't know if I understand uh, understood quite well the question. If I was able to answer it, but this would be my answer. Thank you. There was another question, and Amanda could clear could rephrase it. I didn't understand it quite well the first time. The question was if an observer can be chair of a electronic group work. The question, the answer is no. Why? Because an observer, it is not part, he's not part of a codex of a codex. An observer is the definition of an observer is a, a member that is not part of codex. They cannot then therefore then be chair of one of our organizations organizations inside of Codex. So thank you, Amanda, for clarifying this question because I didn't understand it quite well before. The observer can propose topics, but they cannot be an active member of Codex because you need to be a member to be able to actively uh, have a role on, in it. There, that's true. And the last question, is do you recommend the adopting codex as a national technical standards considering that the standard codex standards don't have a cost and the national standards usually have a cost what i believe is that no hay que, um, descubrir la pólvora. O sea, we do not have to invent the wheel again everything that was already invented by codex we have to take advantage of it Sometimes the standards for codex leave a gap and we have to complement it with national standards. The work at a national level is a work that cannot be avoided. Thank you, Leonardo. I don't know if anybody wants to say anything else to be able to close the webinar. I don't see any virtual hands risen, so. Amanda? Amanda, do you have a question? Thank you, Leonardo, for everything. Your presentation was excellent. It can reach anybody that is starting in Codex, so congratulations for that. Thank you, Dani. And I would just like to say something regarding a few questions that were repeating themselves in the chat. And as Leonardo said, how can the how the, can countries make sure that this limit established by codex linked uh, by risk, risk analysis that uh, is analyzed by its uh, group of experts, the importance of sharing these limits and these data uh, with their countries when the countries are debating on this establishing of, for example, limits of, of veterinary drugs or maximum of contaminants and additives, these are the ones uh, assessed by this group of experts. We always do a official requirement to the countries to be able to share this data. So it is important 
regarding on what Renato explained, that this risk analysis done by the committee of experts can be backed by data handed by every country, shared by every country with the data of our own countries of the national data. If we not don't share this national data, this committee of experts cannot work. And there's therefore sometimes we have data that is not a benefit for each country, for our countries. That's why it is important when data is required from us, we can share our national data because we have been working many years for the asking the countries to share their information because sometimes they're scared they're of sharing this data and but afterwards we can see the result of this because this limit then affects the interests of our own countries so this is all i wanted to say thank you very much donnie thank you amanda for your comment Romel, I don't know if you have a question, have your hands raised. Thank you. Yes, I raised my hand. I would like to say a few final words. I would like to thank Leonardo for your presentation and you, Amanda, for your comments today and everybody for participating and especially because these participation led to very interesting questions. And to welcome you to the world of Codex, those that are starting in this world of Codex and are taking notes of this important work that we're doing worldwide as an organization of the elementary food standards uh, linked to Codex. And we count with each one of you, your participation, active participation is important throughout these regional committees. Thank you for the organization and for the interpreters. Thank you very much. From the middle of the world in Quito, thank you. A last comment, Dani. The floor is yours, of course. I cannot hear you. Yes, can I speak? Okay. My, I would like to thank Leonardo, Amanda, the participants and to highlight this inconsistencies that you can see in the text sometimes the translations are not perfect when you find things that like these please let us know throughout your codex through your codex committee or directly with Romel and Dani to be able to make your question or your, set forth your doubt because sometimes when you change a question uh, one word it can change the whole sentence so i would like to ask you if you find anything there that they have a doubt please let us know so we can correct it thank you very much thank you very much marisa i just put the uh email of the secretary of cecilac so you can send us your comments or doubts and we can answer through the email of the secretary of codex with thank you for being here and uh, we will see you tomorrow from 10 to 12 from the hour of ecuador and we have the presence of amanda lasso who is going to speak about the participations of uh, elementary codex and documents like circular letters and groups of electronic group work and how to prepare ourselves for the plenaries in the com codex committee. And thank you for the participants uh, that were here today. That's it. It's through the same Zoom link with the same code. And please, so we can wrap this up, can you please turn on your camera so we can take a picture and register everybody's participation. Angeles, you can count one, two, three, so we can take a picture and everybody's ready with their cameras on. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And we will wait for you in the next webinars. So this is a series of webinars and we have a lot of topics up yet to come 
and debate together. We are a lot. We are 225 participants. Thank you, everyone. At least this is the number, the highest number that I could identify today. And please, therefore, I would ask for your patience for the pictures because it's a lot of pages that we have to print screen. Thank you very much. This is the first picture. One, two, three. The second page. People are shy, they're not turning on their cameras, but we'll still take a picture anyways. Just a couple more. And the last one. That's it. Thank you, everybody, and we'll see you tomorrow at the same time and the same link. Have a nice day.